I'm Bear Grylls. I go to some of the most dangerous places on Earth to show you what it takes to make it out alive. I've traveled the globe facing challenges in the sort of places you wouldn't last a day without the right survival skills. Now, I'm in Norway, one of the most beautiful, extreme, and wettest places on the planet. I'm going to be taking survival situations to the breaking point. To show you how easy it is to make the wrong decision and what the consequences could be. Here we go. The difference between success and failure often rests on a knife edge. Get it wrong and you could pay the ultimate price. To explore the limits of survival, I'll revisit one of the worst moments of my life when a parachute failed. It's weird putting yourself back into a situation that you almost pay for with your life. Make my longest Tyrolean crossing. And you're not human if your heart rate doesn't go up when you look down. Experience the awesome power of fast rivers. Ah, okay. Very, very close to the edge And he just got up! Rock hard! And rock fast! Go beyond my limits to show you how a simple mistake can cost you your life. What are three things you need for a fire? Three things I need for a fire? Yep. Um, fuel, tinder, and kindling. Well, when you're trying to make fire, you need three total things, which is kindling, tinder, and then you need a nice fluff ball so you can get so you can catch a spark in order to get started. More ship. Got it. It's very important that people think rationally about making fire. Even I don't go into the woods with just a way to make primitive fire. You don't go to a gunfight with a knife. If you think making fire by friction is easy, it is not. Be smart, bring matches or a lighter. There's a lot of misnomers with primitive fire making skills. They can be very difficult, especially if you go to a damp area. So one thing I would always recommend for someone that's an outdoor recreationist, have modern ways to make fire. Bring your wooden matches, bring your metal match, bring two or three different ways to make modern fire and store them on two or three different places on your body. That way if you lose your backpack, you have matches and a match safe in your pocket. If you lose your pants, whatever, you got a lighter strapped around your knife, wearing around your neck, etc. If I've said it once, I've said it a million times. If you're going to venture out into the woods or the wilderness, do an area assessment. Know where you're going and what resources you have at your disposal when it comes to building a fire. You've got to have three things, fuel, tinder, and kindling. And that could be various things in various locations. If anyone goes into the woods and expects to make a primitive fire, they're pretty much dead people. How long should you boil water for? Um, I'd say around like 20 minutes. How long should you boil water for? Well, you should boil for about a quarter water. You should boil for about 20 minutes. And the reason for that is because you, um, you get rid of a lot of uh, contaminants and all that different stuff. When I boil pasta, it tells me to boil it for 8 to 10 minutes. So, 8 to 10 minutes. Apparently there's people that think that it's not safe to drink rainwater. I guess it depends on where you are. You do not want to get Giardia or Cryptosporidium or any other parasite in you while you're out in a survival situation. Be damn sure the water you're drinking is pure enough to drink. As far as terrestrial water, in other words, creeks, lakes, etc., I consider it all suspect for waterborne pathogens. There's parasites, protozoa, bacteria, and viruses. All four will make you go to the bathroom in your pants and vomit excessively. So what you can do, one of the oldest means of water disinfection is to boil it. For example, in the Hawaiian Islands, we took cylinders of bamboo and put non-potable water with that bamboo and gently pasteurized that over the fire for 20 or 30 minutes, just enough to where it started to bubble up, and by the time it cooled down, it was safe to drink. Chances are, if you do drink water from a contaminated source, it is not going to hit you right that moment. It will take a few days before you're flat on your back. 
those few days you had better use to get out of the situation you're in. Is that all sweat? Have some. It's okay. If lost in a place where there is snow on the ground, why don't you want to eat the snow? Well, the reason you don't want to eat the snow is because when you eat the snow, it actually cools down your inner core temperature, and that's not good, so you want to boil it first, and because you don't want your core temperature to drop, because your core temperature drops, and then hypothermia, and frostbite, all that sets in. If lost in a place where there is snow on the ground, would you eat it? Probably not. That is kind of nature's bathroom. What are your four primary survival concerns? Well, your four main ones is food, shelter, fire, and warmth. What are the four primary survival concerns? Well, after finding some sort of shelter, I would want to make sure that my hair is brushed and that I'm in a warm climate so it doesn't get frizzy. Um, that I have access to water to maybe wash my face and brush my teeth. Um, I probably want to stay alive. And hmm, I probably want to get some sleep too. Probably exhausting trying to stay alive, so I'd want to take a nap. Okay. In a survival situation, what suffers because your heart rate goes up? Well, when your heart rate goes up, it's adrenaline pumping through your blood, so you're pumping, so you're going back, and it's going to make you harder. It's going to make you start running in like all directions, thinking you can run out of there. And also, after a while, if you try to make a fire or something, your motor skills will it'll, you can't control yourself. Like you won't have that good of motor skills to like start a fire or build a shelter because you're just going to be too anxiety and all that stuff. Because anytime you're in a real survival situation. Your complex and fine motor skills suffer because your heart rate goes up. And when you have an adrenaline dump in your body, you'll have a very hard time literally making anything that is required to make fire by friction. A lot of the fire making skills I do on dual survival, especially the primitive ones, I've practiced for more than 20 years in doing that. I encourage people to practice those skills, but in the safety of their backyard or at a campsite where they do have matches or they do have a lighter. How many weeks can the human body go without eating? Well, the human body can go without food for up to three weeks, but you can only go up to three days without water, and it depends on the temperature, too. Which of these is equivalent to one large egg? Number one, earthworm. Number two, berries. Number three, mushrooms. Number four, a ant. Well, actually, it, it may surprise you, but it's actually the worm, because the worm is actually 82% protein. What is equivalent to a large egg? I would say the earthworm, because it's bigger than an ant, but they're both Correct. insects. Correct. Yep. There's a lot of myths about eating wild edible plants out there. One of the most deadly things you can do is breach the human barrier by putting something in your mouth that you're not familiar with. And I can tell you that from unfortunate experiences. I have never got poisoned in the wild because I don't eat anything unless I am 100% sure I can eat it. And the two biggest things you need to worry about are berries and mushrooms. There are mushrooms that will kill you if you eat them. Be 100% sure you know what you're eating before you put it in your mouth. There is something called the universal edibility test, and that's when you take something that you're going to eat and you either rub it on your skin or put it on your tongue to taste it. I, for one, don't buy into that. If you are not 100% sure, do not eat it. You can go three weeks without eating. Three weeks. If you can't find your way out of a survival situation in three weeks, you've got bigger problems than eating. You're so food is not ever in short-term survival a priority. In short-term survival, 
which typically lasts three days or less. So if in doubt, do not eat it. Regulate core body temperature, prevent dehydration, prevent hypo and hyperthermia, signal for rescue, and get out of there. Hola! Hola! All right. Well, if thirsty, what's a great resource to look for if you can't find water? Well, if you're in like the Appalachian Mountains and you're in like mountains area and it's wet, the best thing to look for is uh, actually stagnant moss and different kinds of mosses because moss acts as a filter and if you take that and you squeeze it, you, you'll, you'll actually get a lot of water out of it and you don't have to disinfect it, it's already disinfected and everything like that. What is the most important survival skill? Well, there's actually a lot of survival skills that you can um, acquire and that you need. But I think the best is know how to work with nothing and work with what you have. And there's also um, fire starting skill and there's like building shelter skill and there's actually, actually like knife making because I think the most important tool for um, survival situations is a knife because you can get a lot of stuff from just one little knife, and you can do a lot of stuff. You can make shelter, you can make fire, you can hunt, you can do all that just with one little pocket knife. What is the most important survival skill? I would say being resourceful and using what's around you to survive. What does stop a mean? Stop a mean stop, think, observe plan and act. What is the temperature you have boil water at for it to be safe to drink? Well, the average is about 212, 210 degrees. You had to boil the water in order to get rid of all the parasites and all that mean stuff that's in the water. What's one way of finding out if you're getting hypothermia? Probably by using your nose as the indicator. It would turn red if you're getting cold, so maybe you'll get hypothermia. Okay. Why shouldn't you drink your own urine in a survival situation? Well, aside from being disgusting, I would think that all the nutrients that would come from urine would be absorbed by your body, so it's probably not that good for you. Everybody talks about the four components of survival, food, water, shelter, fire. I'm here to tell you, if you're in a survival situation, I don't care if you can do all four of those things. If you are walking out in a self-rescue situation and you don't know how to land navigate, you might as well sit your ass down and camp for the rest of your life because you're not gonna find your way out, period. Know how to land navigate, educate yourself, read books, go to classes. That is a huge survival skill. Look at this jungle. You can't see 100 feet in front of you. You can't see the sun. You don't know what direction you're traveling. Things that can turn people around in the wood are sim simply time of day. When the shadows are different and the light plays different on the trees, it makes the terrain look very different. Route selection in a survival situation when it comes to land navigating is huge. Follow water out of your situation. Small tributaries lead to larger ones, which lead to larger. That's where people are going to be. They're going to conglomerate around large bodies of water. They always have, they always will. If you're doing a lot of backcountry traveling and you're not familiar with orienteering, with map and compass use, you really have no business doing a lot of backcountry traveling. So go into the woods at your comfort level and realize you don't have to get way far off a beaten trail to have a good time. And if you are lost, hopefully you left a 5W game plan with search and rescue so you can stay put so that you can be found in a proximal amount of time because you did leave the game plan.